serve a great and awesome God. Amen? Amen? And He has spoken in His Word what His will is for our lives. In fact, that's what this whole series is based upon. That's what this whole series is about. The will of God. Knowing and living in the will of God. What is God's will for my life? I want to know it so that I can live it. And I hope that that is your prayer as well. As we've already studied over the last couple of weeks, we see that living in the will of God means living for the salvation of the nations. God wants the nations to be saved. And we need to give our lives and spend our lives for the sake of seeing the nations saved. That's what we learned in 1 Timothy. Then we turned into the book of 1 Thessalonians and we looked at chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 about living contentedly is God's will. God wants His people to be content. God wants His people to be content in Him and in what He has provided. And this morning we turn again to the book of 1 Thessalonians and we find one of these very rare occasions when God says, this is my will. This is what I want for your life. And so if you're wanting to know the will of God, He explicitly and clearly defines it in this text. So turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. Consequently, he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning having read this very sobering and personal text of Scripture. Lord, I pray that as we examine it together that we would do so honestly and with full attention. I pray that you would grab our attention and hold us captive to your word this morning. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would grant to us the understanding of this text and the significance it has for our lives individually and our lives as a congregation. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to obey you as we have been obeying you, that we would excel even more in obedience, that our lives might be worthy of the gospel, worthy of you who have called us out of darkness and into light. Father, please bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What happens when you live without control? What happens when you live outside of self-control? Think about it in referring to dieting. If you live a life and you have zero control over the food that you consume and whatever you want to eat, whenever you want to eat, however much you want to eat is what you eat, what happens to your life? When you're dominated by your cravings for fast food or sweets or soda or whatever it is, what happens to you? What happens to you is weight begins to increase, cholesterol begins to rise, ultimately you have heart issues, you have diabetes issues, you have all kinds of health problems and left unchecked and uncontrolled consumption of food will literally kill you will literally kill you. Your quality of life will plummet if you exercise no self-control. And we all know that. Or think about it in regards to, to other areas of life. If you, if, you, if you drink to the point of lack of control so that there is no self-control, you become drunk. And if you are controlled and consumed by it where you can't say no or you can't do it in moderation, then your life can become destroyed by it. We, we can see 
where a lack of self-control, a lack of saying no, a lack of moderation can, can create all kinds of havoc in life. In both cases, we recognize that a lack of self-control is the problem. But do we recognize also that it is also idolatry? You see, we worship what we serve. And we serve what we think will give us joy, what will give us peace, what will give us contentment, what will give us satisfaction, what will give us relief. And we pursue that, whatever that may be. Whatever that object is, whatever that relationship might be, whatever that that activity is, we pursue that in order to obtain pleasure, in order to obtain relief, in order to obtain peace, in order to obtain joy. But it only gives momentary peace and momentary joy and momentary contentment. We're left feeling empty. We're left feeling sometimes guilty. We're left feeling discouraged and depressed. And it all stems back to a lack of self-control and an idolatrous frame of heart. But did you know the same thing is true sexually? That's what this text is about this morning. In the ancient city of Thessalonica, the Greeks thought much like 21st century Americans think. That to say no to one's sexual impulses, to say no to the cravings and the desires of your heart in this particular way was unhealthy. That it would actually harm you mentally and emotionally if you were to deny your sexual desires. We readily recognize that without self-control when it comes to food or alcohol or, or any of those kinds of things, that our lives can be destroyed. Do we recognize the same thing is true about our sexual desires? We don't. We live in the most of a culture that says that you must express yourself however you want, whenever you want, with whomever you want, as much as you want. There is no such thing as saying no to yourself. We live in the midst of a culture consumed with the expression of sexual desires. I mean, it's everywhere. It's every, I mean, it's, it's literally everywhere. It is used to sell all manner of products. It's used in commercials. It's used in TV shows. It's, it's the theme of most comedy shows. It is, it is the theme that is on everyone's mind in this culture. We are consumed with sexuality. And just if that were not enough, now through, through what is happening with the, the same-sex marriage, mar- the, the same marriage stuff that's, that's taking place in the country, the transgenderism issues that are taking place in the country, what the government is doing is, is calling us to all normalize and accept and legitimize the personal choices of individuals whether they be right or wrong. That we're no longer to say that something is wrong. That if it is someone's personal choice and there is mutual consent, then we have no right to say that is wrong. But the Scripture says that is wrong. The Scripture says that this is not the will of God. The will of God is your holiness. And He defines that holiness as self-control abstaining from sexual immorality. You see, the world has gone mad. And we think that maybe that it's not really affected the church. We think that maybe that's just something that's outside of the church, but the reality is it's, it's within the church. Divorce rate within the church is the same as it is without the church, outside the church. Their use of pornography is the same within the church as it is outside the church. Affairs happen within the church. People within the church are struggling legitimately with same-sex attraction and they feel ostracized. They feel like they have no hope or help within the church. This is a problem. What are we going to do What are we going to say? How are we to live in the midst of this culture? We must pursue purity. We must pursue purity. Why? Because it's the will of God. Because this is what God wants. If we want to live in God's will, then we must be willing 
to pursue purity. In this text of Scripture, we find four reasons why believers must live sexually pure lives. Now, some of you at this point in, this, in, the, in the message have already decided, you know what, I don't want to listen to this anymore. You've pulled your phone out, you're scrolling through Facebook or your tweets, and you're trying not to listen to what I'm saying. And I would urge you not to do that. I know that the topic may be uncomfortable. If it is uncomfortable for you to listen to, it is more uncomfortable for me to talk about to you. Especially in the last service where there's most senior adults. <laughs> but the reality is this is an issue that we tend to ignore and we think inappropriate to talk about in church but the reality is we're talking about it and hearing about it everywhere else in life and we're ignoring what God is saying about it. It's not something that's not a big deal. It's not something that's one of those issues that you can take it or leave it. It's, it's a life or death issue. I mean, what, listen to what the Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 6. Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Don't be tricked. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now sometimes we like to quote that verse when we're talking about homosexuality as if that's the worst of the worst. It's not. It's just one more expression of sexual sin. And if homosexual, people who participate in homosexual activity won't inherit the kingdom of God, then people who participate in wrong heterosexual activity won't inherit the kingdom of God either. The scripture gives you four reasons why you ought to pursue purity. Let's look at the text of scripture and my prayer is that you will be convinced by the spirit of the Lord to pursue sexual purity in your own life. Look at verses 1 and 2. Finally then brethren we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave to you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. You must live sexually pure lives because you know this kind of life pleases God. This is what Paul is saying here. He says, you know the commandment, the one he's about to give regarding sexual purity. He says, I've already told you about this. I've already explained this to you. You know this, and you're living like this. And I, I just want to encourage you to keep pursuing this. Why? Because this is how you please the Lord. Do you want to live a life that pleases the Lord? Do you want the Lord to be pleased with your behavior then this must be a part of your thinking. You must be sexually pure. Now what Paul is doing here is calling us to live a life worthy of the calling. He's shifted from the theology of the first few chapters of Thessalonians now into the practical living out of the faith. And he calls us first and fundamentally to sexual purity because just like in our culture and every other human culture that has been on this planet, Sexuality is a major issue. The people are called to continue living in faithfulness. And what's interesting here is Paul is not responding to a problem. He's not responding to a, a church like Corinth. And Corinth, they, were, they were, had all kinds of issues. They had all kinds of problems. When you say, we want our church to be a New Testament church, we don't want to be a church like Corinth. Corinth was messed up. And Paul is in Corinth when he's writing this letter. So all this stuff is on his mind. And he's probably dealing with some of these issues. And he, and he writes to Thessalonica and say, I don't want you to be like Corinth. You're doing well, but keep on doing well. You see, what we need to hear in that is when you think you've reached a level where you won't be tempted by something, you will fall. When you reach a level of biblical maturity or spirituality or holiness, you, you, we, we have a tendency to think of it like, a, like we've reached a, a, a special cog in life and we can't go back from that. It's kind of like playing the game of life. Once you reach a certain level, you know, you can go back to a certain point, but you can't go all the way to the beginning. And we think that's how it is spiritually, but that's not. 
When you think that you are no longer prone to sexual temptation, when you think you're immune to sexual temptation, the enemy is lurking outside your door ready to pounce on you and destroy you. Paul in the Scripture calls us to keep pursuing purity. Keep pursuing purity. And he calls us to do this by means of self-control and legitimate expression. In 1 Corinthians 7, 2, the Scripture says that the legitimate expression of sexuality is between one man and one woman married. And that's it. That is it. Every other expression of sexuality is a sinful twist of God's good plan. And you say, who are you, Phil, to say that what I want is wrong? Nobody. But it's not me who's saying it. It's the Scripture that is saying it. It's God who is saying it. If you, if you have desires sexually and you seek to express or fulfill those desires in any way besides with the person, with the wife or the husband you married, already married, not you're going to marry, but you've already married, then you're living in disobedience to God. You're committing sexual immorality. Well, let's be honest for a moment. Sometimes it's hard, isn't it? Self-control appears very, very hard in the face of the strong desire. The reality is some in this room legitimately are attracted to members of the same sex. And, and it doesn't matter how many people tell you that's wrong, that's still how you feel. And I acknowledge that. But self-control and sexual purity demand that you say no, that you refuse to participate in that kind of an activity because you care more about pleasing God than you do about pleasing yourself. Now others in this room struggle very strongly with heterosexual desire, but you struggle with that desire for someone you're not married to, whether it's the spouse of another person, whether you're single or a teenager and, it's, and, and you don't want to be the only virgin left in your group of friends, or you've been looking at pornography for so long that you're, you're, you're not able to control your, you want the real thing, and you seek to express that sexual desire outside the bounds of marriage, it is sexual immorality. Living a life of self-control pleases the Lord because what you're doing when you, when you say no, when you exercise self-control, is you're saying, I love the Lord more than I love this desire. I want the Lord more than I want this experience. And that's why it pleases the Lord. See, when, when we act upon our desires, we are acting upon our desires in order to, to acquire satisfaction and contentment and joy and peace. That's why we do everything we do. Now, we can believe the Scriptures. The Scriptures, like this morning, I read in Psalm 107, verse 9, that the Lord satisfies the longing heart. The Lord fills up with every good thing the hungry heart. Now, do we believe that or not? If we believe that God does that, then we will pursue the Lord in faith, in trust that He will actually satisfy. If we don't believe that, then we will pursue sexuality, we'll pursue gluttony, we'll pursue whatever it is that we need to be happy. If you want to live a life that pleases the Lord, if you want the Lord to know you love Him, live in His will, and His will is sexual purity. That's the second point. He says you must live sexually pure lives because your sexual purity is the will of God. Look at what he says in verse 3. For this is the will of God. I mean, how often does the Scripture say that? Very rarely, which is why this sermon series is so short. Very rarely does God ever say this is the will of God, but here He does. This is it. This is the will of God. Your 
holiness. And what is that particular stripe of holiness that he's talking about? That is, you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress or defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. Holiness here is defined as abstaining from sexual immorality. It's, it's refusing to participate in sexual immorality. It is saying no to what you want. It is denying yourself. We say, well, Phil, is that healthy to deny yourself? Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. If you want to follow Jesus, if you want to be a Christian, you must deny yourself. You must say no to yourself, sacrifice yourself, and follow after Christ. We have a hard time swallowing this. Why should I have to say no to what I want more than anything? It's because we worship sex that we ask that question. Sex is seen as the highest good, the greatest pleasure, the goal of existence. We cannot live fulfilled or happy or content without it. Do you see the problem? Is that sex has, has become the greatest object of our affections, not God. The question is, can you live without it? Can you live without it? You think, think of the story of the rich young ruler. Do you remember him? He came to Jesus and he said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what did Jesus say? Keep the commandments. He said, teach, I've done that. I've kept the commandments from a child up. Jesus said, you lack one thing. Go sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me. And why did Jesus say that? Because Jesus was going after the man's heart. He knew the idol of his heart was his possessions. He knew the thing he wanted more than anything else was his possessions. He knew the thing he trusted in for safety, security, for joy was his possessions. And Jesus said, if you want to have the kingdom of heaven, you have got to get rid of that idol. And the man went away dejected and sad because he had many possessions. And he wasn't willing to part with his possessions in order to have Christ. That text is not saying we all need to part with our possessions. The text is saying that we need to part with the idol of the heart. Can you live without it? If you cannot live without it, it is your idol. It is your God. The only one we cannot live without is Christ. If anything else occupies that place in your affections, it is your God and you are worshiping it. And for many people, the reason they have, they are unwilling to say no to their desires and they are unwilling to deny themselves is because this is their greatest joy. They walk away from Christ like the rich young ruler because they think that without sex and without the exp ex expression of sex that they want to do, they can't be happy. But Jesus says this is holiness, that we refuse to participate in any sexual activity other than marriage. And if you can't do that, the issue is not so much sex for you, the issue is that you are worshiping a different God. He defines holiness as self-control sexually, controlling your body. Look at verse 4. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel, his own body in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. The word vessel means body, I think. Do we live a life demonstrating self-control or unrestrained passion? Do we deny ourselves? Expression when it's contrary to the will of God? Or do we make excuses for our use of pornography, for our affair, for our fornication, for homosexual participation? Do we use our bodies for sin? Or do we use our bodies for righteousness? Do we act with holiness and honor? Or do we act with disobedience? 
You see, passionate, unrestrained lust, whatever the stripe, whatever the particular expression, is living without the knowledge of God. That's what he says here in verse 5. Not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not God. Who lives without self-control? People who do not know God. The knowledge of God produces self-control. One of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5 is self-control. A demonstration of the evidence of the Spirit in your life is self-control. If there is no self-control, and that's, and that's not just sexually, that's in every area. If there is no self-control, there is no Spirit in you. And if there's no Spirit in you, there is no salvation. We live in the midst of a culture that's pumping us full of this idea that we have arrived into the modern era. That now we need to be free of all of these Puritan and archaic uh, hindrances to our sexuality. As if this is the first time in the history of man men and women have desired to express themselves sexually in some other way other than biblical marriage. But that's not the case. You go all the way back to the ancient Israelites, you look into the ancient Romans, you look at every civilization in the history of man, you're seeing the same things. Even transgenderism was talked about in the book of Deuteronomy. There's nothing new under the sun. The issue is man does not want to live in submission to God. We want to live in submission to ourselves. Holiness is defined as living with self-control. But it's also defined as refusing to take advantage or steal from one another. Look at verse 6. And that no man transgress or defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. In the matter of sexuality, as he's talking about, many of us are defrauding one another, transgressing against one another, taking advantage of one another, using one another for our own personal pleasure. I mean, how would you like it if you found out your spouse was very sexually promiscuous in high school. You wouldn't like it. Why? Because that relationship is the most intimate human relationship imaginable. And having that special bond with that person that you've committed to for the rest of your life is unique and special. And the fact that that would have been taken from you hurts. This is what he's talking about. Don't steal that from somebody else. Teenagers, listen to me. Don't participate in sex before marriage. Abstain. Because that relationship doesn't belong to you. You're just using that person for your own pleasure. That's the spouse of someone else. Would you want someone doing what you're about to do with your future spouse? God will judge sexual immorality. That's what He's saying. God is the avenger of these things. Very quickly, we got two more and we're done. We must live sexually pure lives, number one, because that pleases God, number two, because it's the will of God, number three, because you were saved for the purpose of sexual purity. Look at verse seven. God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in holiness. God didn't call you to give you a a get out of jail free card for continued sexual immorality. God didn't call you and forgive you, and save you, and deliver you so that you could go back to slavery. When God delivered the the Israelites out of Egypt, He took them out of their slavery, out of death, out of misery, out of suffering in order to bring them into paradise. And yet before they got into paradise, some of them wanted to go back to Egypt because they didn't trust God to satisfy. They didn't trust God to deliver. They didn't trust God to provide. And how many of us don't trust God to really satisfy the deepest aching longings of our heart and so we chase after the things of this world, whether it be sexual immorality or something else? We keep going back into the darkness when God has called us to live in the light. God saved you so that you would be holy as He is holy, so that you would reflect His character in the world. And when you reflect His character, you know joy unlike anything you've ever experienced. And finally, he says in verse 8, Consequently, he who rejects this 
is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. You must live sexually pure lives because you reject God, not man, if you reject this command. Now, maybe you're sitting here and you think I'm out of touch with reality or that I'm a bigot spewing hate speech or that I just want you to be miserable because I'm a preacher and that's what preachers want. But the reality of the matter is if you dismiss the, the, the text of Scripture, you're not dismissing Phil, you're dismissing the Lord of glory. Now, I'm not perfect and I will make mistakes. But when this book says this is the will of God and you turn away from that because you don't want to exercise self-control, because you don't think that you, that you can have joy apart from that, you are turning from God and you are turning to an idol and that idol will take you to hell. Understand the sobriety with which we should hear this word. The will of God is our sexual purity. Will we submit to God in joyful acknowledgement that He is wiser than we are, that He knows best, trusting in Him? We've seen four reasons why we should live sexually pure lives. Because it pleases God. Because it's the will of God. Because you were saved for this purpose. And because if you reject this command, you're rejecting God. How will you respond? And some of you are sitting here and in your heart you're feeling like God hates me because I, I've committed sexual immorality. I've... I've done those things or I'm struggling with those desires. Sexual immorality is no more greater sin than lying or gossiping or stealing or drunkenness or whatever. But it is sin. But we sang about a God who is gracious and mercy and full of loving kindness who stands with His arms open and says, Turn from your sin and turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. This morning, the day of salvation is open to you. Trust in Christ and be saved. And He will change you on the inside and begin to help you overcome your sinful desires. Or maybe you're a Christian this morning and, and you have been committing sexual immorality. You've been viewing pornography. You've been contemplating affair or maybe you're having an affair you must repent you must stop engaging in this behavior and you must turn back to the Lord confess your sin to God but confess it to a brother or sister so that they can pray for you and hold you accountable maybe you're struggling with same-sex attraction you are not anathema you are not accursed any more than anybody else in this room is The Lord forgives all manner of sin. The Lord delivers and saves and gives joy. Do not believe the rhetoric of the world that tells you this is normal, this is right, this is good. Go and express yourself. It is a, it is a, your sinful nature that is twisting something that God gave you and using it to turn you away from the Lord. Let us help you. Let us help you deal with it and walk through it. We will stand with you. We will not condemn you, but we will tell you the truth in love. I urge you to use this time of response this morning to repent and turn, into, turn to Christ. Whatever you are, wherever you are on the spectrum of response we've talked about, Today is a day of mercy. Today is a day of grace. God speaks these things so that we will come back to Him. Let us pursue purity. Let's pray.